The Stirling engine is an incredible invention with many uses today. In fact, the Stirling engine can be made so efficient that NASA has been considering the principle to improve the efficiency of their radioisotope thermoelectric generators which are used on some of their spacecraft. In this video I machine a Stirling engine, but I wanted to do something different to all the others out there, so I scaled it down to something that fits nicely on the end of a pencil. Here I begin with the cylinder. I make the cylinder from brass and start by filing the round bar square. Of course there are many methods of achieving this, but here I index the bar in the headstock and use two rollers to guide the file. The Stirling engine works based on a temperature differential. The cylinder must therefore be cooled. Now I move on to turning the outside of the cooling fins that surround the cylinder. I could have left this a square profile, but I prefer the aesthetics of circular cooling fins. I could use a parting tool to machine the fins, but here I choose to use a slitting saw rotating the opposite direction to the workpiece. Still mounted in the lathe, I cut a hole in the side with an end mill. This forms a recess to accept the hot cap, which I will make later in the video. Now I drill a 1mm hole opposite to the recess, which will accept a reciprocating rod connected to the displacer piston. The displacer is made an intentionally loose fit in the hot cap to allow the flow of air around the outside. The power piston, on the other hand, must be a really precise fit in the main cylinder, which I am machining here. This fit must be gas tight, but the power piston must also be able to move freely. After parting the cylinder off, I mount it in a collet in reverse to machine a boss and tap an M2 thread in the bottom which will allow me to bolt it to a base plate. And that's the cylinder done, let's move on to the displacer piston next. Since this component reciprocates, it is good practice to make it as light as possible, so I make this from aluminium. I tap an M1 thread in the end of the displacer to accept the 1mm diameter reciprocating rod. I machine a point on the end of the displacer to reduce its drag coefficient. At this small scale it can be a challenge to achieve the required tolerances for the engine to even run, so I like to consider these small design features to improve its chance of running at the end.
to machine the power piston, I start by cutting a slot in some 3mm diameter silver steel, and then cross drill at 90 degrees to this for the connecting rod and gudgeon pin respectively. To polish the surface and remove any burrs, I use a sapphire burnishing tool. This also work hardens the surface of the material. I cut the piston slightly over length and then face off the sawn end. Now it's time to make the flywheel. There are many approaches we can take to manufacture this component, but I wanted to take this opportunity to show you something we haven't covered in any of our previous videos. It begins on the PC where Hazel designs the flywheel in CAD. The design is 3D printed using a resin printer. The resin I use here is wax based, which allows me to melt it later in the process. Here's the 3D printed flywheel including additional support material which is required for the 3D printing. I want to maintain this geometry but transform it into brass. I will do this using investment casting. Before I start pouring molten metal though, there are a few preparation steps. Firstly, I sprue the 3D model with wax. This forms the pathway for molten metal to flow. The stainless steel tube is known as the flask, and this is to contain the investment slurry, which I make from investment powder and water. The investment powder is made from very fine silica particles, basically ground glass. It is important to wear respiratory protection when using this powder. The powder and water are mixed together to form the slurry. The mixing process agitates the mixture, which inevitably introduces air bubbles. Therefore, I degas the slurry in a vacuum chamber. I then pour the mixture into the flask containing the 3D printed flywheel. The flask is then set aside for a couple of hours to let the slurry cure. Once cured, the rubber flask base can be peeled off. Now we have the wax geometry surrounded by ceramic. I previously mentioned that I could melt the 3D printed model, so this is what I now do. I place the flask in the furnace and ramp the furnace to a starting temperature of 120 degrees centigrade. What follows is a series of temperature ramps up to 730 degrees centigrade, which melts the wax and then burns off any residue and fully cures the investment mixture. The flask is removed from the furnace at around 650 degrees centigrade to pour the molten metal into now what is hopefully a flywheel shaped cavity. The hot flask is placed over a hole in the vacuum chamber to help suck the metal into the mold cavity. Unfortunately, not everything goes perfectly. Some interference between the crucible and the pressure gauge on the vacuum chamber ends up in some metal spillage. But don't worry, we still got away with it. I put the flywheel into my larger lathe to remove the support material, but leaving the stub in the middle to provide me with a way to grip the flywheel in the watchmaker's lathe. Mm -hmm. 
I then remove the majority of the remaining material using the milling machine. The flywheel is then cleaned up in the watchmaker's lathe and a 1.5mm hole for the main shaft is drilled in the centre. The flywheel is reversed and held in the step collet to finish up the other side of the component and shorten the boss. To finish up this part I paint the flywheel spokes and rim. The beam Stirling engine is defined by a horizontal beam which connects the flywheel to the power piston. This beam needs to pivot about a point which leads us on to the next component. Here I am machining the main central pillar with a pivot point in the top for the beam and also a thread and flange on the bottom to allow me to bolt it to the engine base plate. Once the pillar has been turned and roughly polished, I move on to cutting the slot to clear the beam. I then cross drill 0.7mm to accept the pin about which the beam will pivot. I will open this hole up with a tapered brooch on assembly and fit it with a tapered pin. This is much easier than making a parallel press fit pin or using a threaded fitting. I mill away a region near the bottom of the pillar to clear a reciprocating fitting. This will become clear later when we assemble the engine. I also machine a slot for the connecting rod between the flywheel and the displacer. Now I reverse the component in the collet to cut the thread on the bottom of the pillar. I use the tailstock chuck to align the pillar axial since I am only gripping on the flange which isn't a very large register.
This is the last main component which we bolt to the base plate, and that is the bearing housing. I procured some tiny ball racers with a 1.5mm ID to support the flywheel. We will press the bearings into this component. I machine the bore for the bearings by just plunging straight in with an end mill. As you can see with the bore micrometer, this produces a hole 1 micron shy of 4mm, which should produce a perfect press fit for the ball racers. I round over the top of the bearing housing with a file. I've mentioned the base plate a few times and now it's time to make it. I prepared a small brass plate off camera and put it in the milling machine to drill holes to which I can attach the cylinder, pillar and bearing housing. I use the milling machine here because I have it fitted with a digital readout which allows me to accurately position the holes. I shape the outside of the base plate to something less boring than a rectangle. I begin by marking out my cutting lines with a height gauge. Let's make one last key component and then we can get cracking on the assembly. I shall show you the making of the other small bits and pieces as the engine is put together. This part is the hot cap and is the component that heat is applied to for the engine to run. I make this from stainless steel which has a low thermal conductivity. This is important to maximise that temperature differential that I mentioned nearer the start of the video. Before we assemble the engine, I will pass on to Hazel to introduce our sponsor. A huge thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Have you ever wanted to learn more about the science behind our engineering projects? It can be hard to know where to start, but this is where Brilliant.org can help. Brilliant is an online learning platform where you can learn maths and science at your own pace. Their interactive courses are a fun and intuitive way to refresh your STEM knowledge or learn brand new skills. 
There are thousands of lessons to choose from, covering everything from foundational maths and everyday science to quantum computing and AI, with new topics being added every month. If you'd like to improve your understanding of the physics behind how the Stirling engine works, such as the ideal gas law, check out Brilliant's Classical Mechanics course. All of the lessons are beautifully designed with hands-on activities and puzzles, which help to break up the lessons and reinforce new concepts as you learn. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Cronova Engineering or click on the link in the description. The first 200 viewers to sign up will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Let's begin with bolting the cylinder onto the base plate. I then modified the end of a pencil with a threaded insert which takes the main pillar after it is passed through the base plate. The bearing housing is then bolted down. This is the crank. Although I didn't show how this is made, I used all of the same principles covered previously in the video. The pin is offset by 1.5mm which results in a piston stroke of 3mm. Since the piston diameter is also 3mm, this is a 0.02cc engine. Once the piston has been lubricated and fitted, I move on to fitting the beam and connecting rods. These are pinned in place with tapered pins. How did I go about making these pins? Although they are only 0.8mm in diameter, they are actually pretty easy to make. I start by cutting a length of piano wire and then I face it off and deburr it. I simply apply a slight taper with a diamond stone and burnisher. Remember that piano wire is hardened, so I avoid using my files here. I use a different approach for the pin connecting the two con rods, since I don't have enough metal to press fit a tapered pin here. I stick with the 0.8mm diameter pin but I cross drill it 0.4mm to take another tapered pin which stops it from falling out. This cross drilling is too small for my cross slide mounted drilling attachment since I can't achieve the spindle speeds or the feel to complete this operation without risk of breaking the drill bit. Fortunately when I built my high speed vertical drill I also made a fitting which allows me to mount it onto the lathe. Now let's fit the displacer and the displacer conrod which passes through the slot in the pillar. I made the conrods and beam from titanium shim. Titanium has a low density which means that they can be made lightweight and it has this springy quality which makes the final conrods robust. The shim is thin enough to be cut with scissors. I drill the holes for the pins on my small high speed drill and then round over the ends with a needle file.
And here's the final piece of the puzzle, the hot cap. I just made this a press fit into the recess I machined with the end mill near the start of the video. And now it's time to answer the question we've all been asking, will it run? Thanks for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I did making it. For more machining, engineering and science content please subscribe to our channel. See you in the next one.